Hello, this is Study Coach UK with the continuing story, the Indian story, Nirvana, meditation, knowledge, wisdom, with me, Morel Bernard, the continuation of the story, what is happening to Siddhartha. So the last words were, the Buddha reached the ears of the young men with good and with bad talk, with praise and with defamation. It was as if the plague had broken out in the country and news had been spreading around that in one or another place there was a man, a wise man, a knowledgeable one, whose word and breath was enough to heal everyone who had been infected with a pestilence. And as such news would go through the land and everyone would talk about it, many would believe, many would doubt, but many would get on their way as soon as possible to seek the wise man, the helper, just like this myth ran through the land, that fragrant myth of Gautama, the Buddha, the wise man of the family of Sakya. He possessed, so the believers said, the highest enlightenment. He remembered his previous lives, he had reached the nirvana and never returned into the cycle, was never again submerged in the murky river of physical forms. Many wonderful and unbelievable things were reported of him. He had performed miracles, had overcome the devil, had spoken to the gods. But his enemies and disbelievers said this Katama was a vain seducer. He would spend his days in luxury, scorned the offerings, was without learning, and knew neither exercises nor self-castigation. The myth of Buddha sounded sweet. The scent of magic flowed from these reports. After all, the world was sick Life was hard to bear. And behold, here a source seemed to spring forth. Here a messenger seemed to call out, comforting, mild, full of noble promises. Everywhere where the rumour of Buddha was heard, everywhere in the lands of India, the young men listened up, fell to longing, fell to hope, and among the Brahmins, sons of the towns and villages, every pilgrim and stranger was welcome when he brought news of him, the exalted one, the Sakyamuni. The myth had also reached the Samans in the forest, and also Siddhartha, and also Govinda. Slowly, drop by drop, Every drop laden with hope, every drop laden with doubt. They rarely talked about it because the oldest one of the Samanas did not like this myth. He had heard that this alleged Buddha used to be an ascetic before and had lived in the forest, but had then turned back to luxury and worldly pleasures, and he had no high opinion of this Gautama. Oh, said Harper, Govinda spoke one day to his friend. Today I was in the village, and a Brahman invited me into his house, and in his house there was a son of a Brahman from Magatha, who has seen the Buddha with his own eyes, and has heard him teach. Verily, this made my chest ache when I breathe, and thought to myself, if only I would too, if only we both would do, said Arthur, and me live to see the hour when we will hear the teaching from the mouth of this perfected man. Speak, friend. Wouldn't we want to go there too and listen to the teachings from the Buddha's mouth? Siddhartha said, Always, O oh Govinda, I thought, Govinda would stay with the Samanas. 
always, I had believed his goal was to live to be 60 and 70 years of age and to keep on practicing those feats and exercises which are becoming a samana. But behold, I had not known Govinda well enough. I knew little of his heart. So now you, my faithful friend, want to take a new path and go there where the Buddha speaks and spreads his teachings? Govinda said, You're mocking me. Mock me if you like, said Hartha. But have you not also developed a desire, an eagerness to hear these teachings? And have you not at one time said to me you would not walk the path of the Samanas for much longer? At this, Siddhartha laughed in his very own manner, in which his voice assumed a touch of sadness and a touch of mockery and said, Well, Govinda, you've spoken well. You've remembered correctly. If you only remembered the other thing as well, You've heard from me, which is that I have grown distrustful and tired against teachings and learning, and that my faith in words which are brought to us by teachers and small. But let's do it, my dear. I'm willing to listen to these teachings, though in my heart I believe that we've already tasted the best fruit of these teachings. Govinda said, Your willingness delights my heart. But tell me, how should this be possible? How should the Gautama's teachings, even before we have heard them, have already revealed their best fruit to us? Siddhartha said, Let us eat this fruit and wait for the rest, O Govinda. But this fruit which we already now receive thanks to the Gautama consisted in him calling us away from the Samanas. Whether he has also other and better things to give us, O oh friend, let us await with calm hearts. On this very same day, Siddhartha informed the oldest one of the Samanas of his decision that he wanted to leave him. He informed the oldest one with all the courtesy and modesty becoming to a younger one and a student. But the Samana became angry because the two young men wanted to leave him and talk loudly and use crude swear words. Govinda was startled and became embarrassed. But Siddhartha put his mouth close to Govinda's ear and whispered to him, Now I want to show the old man that I've learned something from him. Positioning himself closely in front of the Samana with a concentrated soul, he captured the old man's glance with his glances, deprived him of his power, made him mute, took away his free will subdued him under his own will, commanded him to do silently whatever he demanded him to do. The old man became mute, his eyes became motionless, his will was paralysed, his arms were hanging down without power. He had fallen victim to Siddhartha's spell. But Siddhartha's thoughts brought the Samana under their control. He had to carry out what they commanded. And thus the old man made several bows, performed gestures of blessing, spoke stammeringly a godly wish for a good journey. And the young men returned the bows with thanks, returned the wish, went on their way with salutations. On the way, Govinda said, O oh, Siddhartha, you have learned more from the Samanas than I knew. It is hard. 
it is very hard to cast a spell on an old savannah. Truly, if you had stayed there, you would soon have learned to walk on water. I do not seek to walk on water, said Siddhartha. Let old Samanas be content with such feats. In the town of Savathi, every child knew the name of the exalted Buddha, and every house was prepared to fill the alms dish of Gautama's disciples, the silently begging ones. Near the town was Gautama's favourite place to stay, the grove of Jetaba, which the rich merchant Anna Pikinda, an obedient worshipper of the exalted one, had given him and his people for a gift. All tales and answers which the two young ascetics had received in their search for Gautama's abode had pointed them towards this area. And arriving at Savathi, in the very first house, before the door of which they stopped to beg, food has been offered to them, and they accepted the food. And Siddhartha asked the woman who handed them the food, We would like to know, O charitable one, where the Buddha dwells the most venerable one, for we are two samanas from the forest and have come to see him, the perfected one, and to hear the teachings from his mouth. The woman said, Here, you have truly come to the right place, you samanas from the forest. You should know in Jitavana, in the garden of Anapinkida, is where the exalted one dwells. There you pilgrims shall spend the night, for there is enough space for the innumerable who flock here to hear the teachings from his mouth. This made Govinda happy and full of joy. He exclaimed, Well, so thus we have reached our destination and our path has come to an end. But tell us, O mother of the pilgrims, do you know him, the Buddha? Have you seen him with your own eyes? The woman said, Many times I have seen him, the exalted one. On many days I have seen him, walking through the alleys in silence, wearing his yellow cloak, presenting his arms dish in silence at the doors of the houses, leaving with a filled dish. Delightedly, Govinda listened and wanted to ask and hear much more, but Siddhartha urged him on to walk on. They thanked and left and hardly had to ask directions for rather many pilgrims and monks as well from Gautama's community were on their way to the Jitabana. And since they reached it at night, there were constant arrivals, shouts, and talk of those who sought shelter and got it. The two Samanas, accustomed to life in the forest, found quickly and without making any noise a place to stay, and rested there until the morning. At sunrise, they saw with astonishment what a large crowd of believers and curious people had spent the night here. On all parts of the marvellous grove, monks walked in yellow robes, under the trees they sat here and there in deep contemplation or in a conversation about spiritual matters. The shady gardens looked like a city, full of people, bustling like bees. The majority of the monks went out with their arms dish to collect food in town for their lunch, the only meal of the day. The Buddha himself, the enlightened one, was also in the habit of taking this walk to beg in the morning. Siddhartha saw him, and he instantly recognised him, as if a god had pointed him out to him. He saw him, a simple man, in a yellow robe, 
bearing the arms dish in his hand, walking silently. Look here, said Arthur, said quietly to Govinda, this one is the Buddha. Attentively, Govinda looked at the monk in the yellow robe, who seemed to be in no way different from the hundreds of other monks. And soon, Govinda also realised this is the one, and they followed him and observed him. The Buddha went on his way, modestly and deep in his thoughts. His calm face was neither happy nor sad. It seemed to smile quietly and inwardly, with a hidden smile, quiet, calm, somewhat resembling a healthy child. The Buddha walked, wore the robe, and placed his feet just as all of his monks did, according to a precise rule. But his face and his walk, his quietly lowered glance, his quietly dangling hand and even every finger of his quietly dangling hand expressed peace, expressed perfection, did not search, did not imitate, breathe softly in an unwitheringly calm, in an unwithering light and untouchable peace. Thus Gautama walked towards the town to collect arms. And the two Samanans recognised him solely by the perfection of his calm, by the quietness of his appearance, in which there was no searching, no desire, no imitation, no effort to be seen, only light and peace. Today we'll hear the teachings from his mouth, said Govinda. Siddhartha did not answer. He felt little curiosity for the teachings. He did not believe that they would teach him anything new. But he had, just as Govinda had, heard the contents of his Buddha's teachings again and again, though these reports only represented second or third-hand information. But attentively, he looked at Gautama's head, his shoulders, his feet, his quietly dangling hand, and it seemed to him as if every joint of every finger of this hand was of these teachings, spoke off, breathed off, exhaled the fragrant of glistened of truth. This man, this Buddha, was truthful down to the gesture of his last finger. This man was holy. Never before, said Harvey, had venerated a person so much. Never before he had loved a person as much as this one. They both followed the Buddha until they reached the town and then returned in silence. For they themselves intended to abstain from on this day. They saw Gautama returning. What he ate could not even have satisfied a bird's appetite and they saw him retiring into the shade of the mango trees. But in the evening, when the heat cooled down and everyone in the camp started to bustle about and gathered around, they heard the Buddha teaching. They heard his voice, and it was also perfected, was of perfect calmness, was of full of peace. Gautama taught the teachings of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of the way to relieve suffering, calmly and clearly, his quiet speech flowed on. Suffering was life, full of suffering was the world, but salvation from suffering had been found. Salvation was obtained by him who would walk the path of the Buddha. With a soft, yet firm voice, the exalted one spoke, taught the four main doctrines, taught the eightfold path. Patiently he went the usual path of the teachings, of the examples, of the repetitions. Brightly and quietly, his voice hovered over the listeners like a light, like a a starry sky. When the Buddha, night had already fallen, ended his speech. Many pilgrims stepped forward 
and asked to accept into the community, sought refuge in the teachings, and Gautama accepted them by speaking. You have heard the teachings well. It has come to you well. Thus join us and walk in holiness to put an end to all suffering. Behold, then Govinda, the shy one, also stepped forward and spoke. I also take my refuge in the exalted one and his teachings. And he asked to accept it into the community of his disciples and was accepted. Right afterwards, when the Buddha had retired for the night, Govinda turned to Siddhartha and spoke eagerly. Siddhartha, it is not my place to scold you. We have both heard the exalted one. We have both perceived the teachings. Govinda has heard the teachings. He has taken refuge in it. But you, my honoured friend, don't you also want to walk the path of salvation? Would you want to hesitate? Do you want to wait any longer? Siddhartha awakened as if he had been asleep when he heard Govinda's words. For a long time, he looked into Govinda's face. Then he spoke quietly, in a voice without mockery. Govinda, my friend, now you have taken this step. Now you have chosen this path. Always, Ho Govinda, you've been my friend. You've always walked one step behind me. Often I've thought, won't Govinda for once also take a step by himself without me, out of his own soul? Behold, now you've turned into a man and are choosing your path for yourself. I wish that you would go it up to its end, O my friend, that you shall find Salvation. Govinda, not completely understanding it yet, repeated his question in an impatient tone. Speak up, I beg you, my dear. Tell me, since it could not be any other way, that you also, my learned friend, will take your refuge with the exalted Buddha. Siddhartha placed his hand on Govinda's shoulder. You fail to hear my good wish for you, O Govinda. I'm repeating it. I wish that you would go this path up to its end, that you shall find salvation. In this moment, Govinda realized that his friend had left him and he started to weep. Siddhartha, he exclaimed lamentingly. Siddhartha, kindly spoke to him. Don't forget, Govinda, that you are now one of the Samanas of the Buddha. You have renounced your home and your parents, renounced your birth and possessions, renounced your free will, renounced your friendship. This is what the teachings require. This is what the exalted one wants. This is what you wanted for yourself. Tomorrow, O Govinda, I'll leave you. Oh, ah, oh, join me. Join me for the next video. The next video of the Indian story of Nirvana. Meditation, knowledge and wisdom is found here. Join me for the next video with me. Moral Bernard. See you then.